There's so many wars that we fought There's so many things that aren't right There's so many laws that can bind us There's so many things that can blind us But with you we're marching on 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 Welcome to session 8 of the Bible survey. We've looked at the Exodus. We've looked at how God's people came to Mount Sinai and received the law. And then they moved on from Mount Sinai to the borders of the promised land where the wheels, as it were, came off. And instead of entering the land that God had offered them, they disobeyed and they wandered in the wilderness for close on 40 years and finally, they were ready to enter the land. And the two books of the Bible that deal with this period of wilderness wandering are Numbers and Deuteronomy, both attributed largely to Moses. So let's pray, and we're going to look tonight at Numbers and Deuteronomy, and the theme is in the wilderness. So Father, we thank you for the story of salvation as your people enter into the wilderness. And we pray that we may learn the lessons about you and your people from this wilderness experience. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, we're going to look at, as I said, Numbers first of all. Numbers gets its name from the two censuses, the two numberings that feature in the book, chapter 1 and chapter 26. However, the Hebrew name for the book means in the wilderness, which is more appropriate because that's what the book is about, the uh, experience of the 40 years in the wilderness. And so we're going to see what we can learn about God and God's people from this wilderness Experience, And I'm going to kind of gather the, the message of Numbers together under a number of headings. First one is Numbers and Order. We noticed, uh, I mentioned earlier a moment ago, that the fighting men of Israel were numbered in chapter 1 and in chapter 26. And then the Israelite camp was arranged with the tent of meeting, the center of worship, and the Levites in the center, and the 12 tribes were arranged around the tabernacle with three tribes on the east, three tribes on the, in the south, three in the west, and three in the north. You can see that in Numbers chapter 2. They were in the shape of a cross. Do you see that? And uh, the worship of God is at the center. Do you think there's anything significant about that? And they were given an order for their traveling in Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 to 28. The tribe of Judah in front, followed by Issachar and Zebulun. Then came the tabernacle carried by the Levites. Then came Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And then the Kohathites, who were also part of the tribe of Levi carrying the holy things that went inside the tabernacle, and after them Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, and finally bringing up the rear the tribes of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. So are there any lessons that we can learn from this numbers and order? Well, we can learn that to some extent God is concerned about numbers. Uh, some people say, no, it's not uh, a matter of numbers. It's just a matter of maturity. We've got to let the Lord have his way. Well, that is partly true, but it's also partly about numbers. And even in the New Testament, the book of Acts gives us about 14 numerical progress reports concerning the growth of the church. And I don't know if they're all in your notes, but... Uh, they're in Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47, Acts 4.4, Acts 5.14, Acts 6.1, Acts 6.7. 
931, 935, 942. Are you getting this? 1121, 1124, 141, 165, 1712. 14 times in the book of Acts we are told of the numerical expansion of the church. Some examples, Acts 241. And there were added that day 3,000 souls. So on one day, the church grew from 120 to 3,120. 120 is what we have like more or less on a Sunday morning. Imagine if you came next Sunday and there were 3,000 more people here. That is numerical explosion. Wouldn't that be great? Some people would hate it. You know, their favorite seat was just completely overwhelmed. And uh, verse 47 of the same Acts 2 says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 4.4 4. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. What we learn from this is that we don't want to be obsessed about it, but we do need to be concerned about the numerical growth of the church. I believe as a church we need to have a vision that includes numbers numerical growth why don't we aim to double the size of this church from about 200 to 400 in the next year or so and then also another lesson is that god obviously wants his people to have some order in their life together and to receive from god arrangements about how to move together in obedience, you know, even in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, it says, all things should be done decently and in order. Uh, each individual just doing what he or she thinks is right may lead to chaos rather than the ordered community of numbers. So that's the first lesson, order and numbers. Secondly, specialness. And blessings. The specialness of God's people is represented in the Levites, the Nazarites, and the priests. The Levites, uh, you can read about them, Numbers chapter 1, chapter 8, chapter 18. They were to be taken instead of all the firstborn children or sons of Israel. And this related back to the Passover when the Israelite firstborn sons were spared and were claimed to belong to God. When the, Israelite, uh, when the Egyptian firstborn all died, and God passed over his people and spared the firstborn, he then said, all the firstborn of Israel belong to God. And the Levites were taken to represent the firstborn. And they are exempt from the census that is taken, and they are set apart for a special ministry in the tabernacle. Then there are the Nazarites who were special because of a vow that they took, which is described in Numbers 6 verse 2 as to separate himself to the Lord for a period of time. And the details of the Nazarite vow, and if you want to check how naughty Samson was, you will see how many of these details he broke not just that eventually his hair got cut they would have no alcohol or grape grape derived drinks or food no cutting of hair no going near dead bodies so what on earth was he doing fiddling around with a dead lion and uh, they would offer special sacrifices when the vow was completed that's numbers chapter six so they were special and then, of course, the priests had a very special ministry of worship to God and of blessing to the people. And there's that beautiful priestly blessing in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 27. And I'll just read it to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. So you shall put my name on the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Isn't that beautiful? That's the priestly blessing, because they were special, as were the Nazarites and the Levites. And then thirdly, the third thing we notice in, in Numbers is that there were problems and provisions. God's people are and were far from perfect. Are there any perfect people in the church today? 
Not many, eh? Apart from you and me. What a joke. And because of this imperfection, many problems arose. And God was making provision for sin to be dealt with and also for sickness to be healed. And some of the laws that are given in Numbers are looking forward to the days when Israel will be living in the land or they're about to enter the land and he makes provision and deals with some of the problems. And I'm not going to go through all of them. In your notes, you will see a fairly long list of the problems and the provisions in the book of Numbers. You can read them. Number four, the fourth lesson from Numbers concerns worship and offerings. The central and highest activity of God's people had always to be the worship of of God. What is the main function of the church? To worship God and to glorify Him forever. Even more important than evangelism, which is very important, is the worship of God. That has to be the highest and central priority of the church, is to worship God. And in number seven, we see how the tabernacle was consecrated with 12 days of worship and offerings, wagons and oxen were presented for the service of the tabernacle. They offered silver plates and basins full of flour, oil, grain. They offered gold dishes full of incense, bulls, rams, lambs, goats, and oxen. It was lavish, and it was loud, and it was extravagant, and it was just for the glory of God. And after these 12 days of worship and sacrifice, we are told in verse 89 of Numbers chapter 7 that when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. And this is the heart of worship, to hear the voice of God. That is why we gather to worship. We, we want to glorify Him, but we also want to hear Him. And that is why we pay attention to the Scriptures, because that is the voice of God speaking to His people. Symbolic of the presence of God in the tabernacle was the lampstand with the seven lamps, Numbers 8, 1 to 4. And then in Numbers chapter 9, verses 1 to 14, the Israelites worship God by celebrating the Passover. Fifth aspect of, uh, of, of truth from the book of Numbers concerns leadership and rebellion. Moses finds his leadership responsibility a huge burden. Numbers 11, uh, we're told that he said to God, I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. And so God anoints 70 other leaders or elders to share in the leadership. Numbers 11, 16 and 17 and 24 to 25. So God is expanding the leadership team of Israel. And Miriam... And Aaron, the brother and sister of Moses, rebel against the leadership of Moses. And Miriam gets sick. It's a kind of a warning. Don't rebel against God's appointed leaders. Then there's another rebellion, what is known as Korah's Rebellion, in chapter 16, where 250 leaders of the congregation challenge the leadership of Moses and Aaron, and many of them were Levites who were also seeking the priesthood. They wanted to be priests as well as Levites, as well as their duties in the tabernacle. And really we're told in verse 11 of chapter 16 that this was a rebellion against the Lord. When you re rebel against God's appointed leaders, behind that is actually a rebellion against the Lord. So leaders, if people rebel against you, don't take it personally. It's against the Lord. And if only God did some of this stuff, eh? 
the Lord dealt with the rebellion by opening the ground and swallowing up these rebellious ones. Wouldn't that be? No, I'm, sto I'm stopping. I'm being nasty. And then, of course, the congregation blamed Moses for the deaths of these 250 rebels. And the Lord's cloud of glory covered the tent of meeting, and God's judgment was only turned away from the congregation by the atoning activity of Aaron, number 16, 40 to 51. And Aaron is identified as a special priest, a special leader when his staff sprouts. It's an amazing miracle. All the chiefs, they're still not satisfied that Aaron has been called to a special leadership role, so they all had to place their staffs in the tabernacle as directed by the Lord, and Aaron's staff alone sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossom, number 17. And, and almonds. Is that what it says? It just went crazy. Eh? So they all could see supernaturally, Aaron, he's the leader. And then, of course, we see another aspect of leadership where towards the end of the book of Numbers, Joshua is commissioned to lead as the successor of Moses. Sixth point from Numbers rega regards the anointing of God's Spirit and pictures given by the Holy Spirit. God, we're told, anoints the 70 elders and it becomes a prophetic picture or promise that is at least partially fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Let me read to you from Numbers chapter 11, verses 25 to 29. It says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, that's Moses, and took some of the spirit that was on him, that's some of the anointing that was on him, and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. So it was a prophetic anointing. But they did not continue doing so. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. So they'd been selected, uh, but they weren't out in the, in the tent of meeting at the time, but the Spirit came on them as well. Uh, they were among the registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua didn't yet understand that the Lord wants everyone to experience this prophetic spirit. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, My Lord Moses, stop them. And then Moses says this prophetic statement. Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And that is fulfilled, at least partially, on the day of Pentecost, where we are told that God poured out his spirit on the church and they began to prophesy and that is the will of God the desire of God is that all his people are prophets and that his spirit would be on them all so we need to eagerly desire spiritual gifts and especially that we might prophesy and then if you look at numbers chapter 12 verse 6 it's very interesting how you receive prophetic revelation we're told is through pictures through the language of the spirit which is a picture language and in uh, numbers chapter 12 verse 6 he said hear my words if there is a prophet among you uh, i the lord make myself known to him in a vision i speak with him in a dream and so the lesson is that the language of god's spirit is a picture language you need to learn to tune in to these pictures what is the difference between a dream and a vision well the difference is whether you are awake or asleep. If you are asleep, it's a dream. And if you're awake, it's a vision. So if you fall asleep in church, you have a dream. And if you're not asleep and you get a picture, it's a vision. You can also tell your age by whether you're getting a lot of dreams or visions. Check out Acts 2 and you'll see. Uh, in verse 17, God said, In the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, fulfilling the desire of Moses that everyone would be a prophet. And on your sons and daughters, it's not a male thing, it's for men and women. Uh, it's for slaves and free, uh, and they shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So if you're getting a lot of dreams, you're getting a lot of visions, work it out. I get a lot of visions, by the way. It's out of character with my age, but that's all right. Okay, number seven, the seventh point. There's only 48. Don't worry, we're getting there. But number seven, 
the seventh message from the book of Numbers regards guidance and disobedience. God tells these people very simply that they are to follow the cloud. There used to be an old charismatic chorus, move with the cloud. Shall we sing it together? The cloud of glory is moving, move with the cloud. When the cloud moves, the people must follow. That is the message of Numbers chapter 9, 15 to 23. God's presence was symbolized in the cloud by day and the fire by night that covered the tabernacle. And when the cloud lifted, the people set out. When the cloud settled, the people camped. They were following God's presence. What a wonderful lesson. We need to follow the anointing of God. Learn to seek and sense where is the presence of God moving. And so they set out from Mount Sinai. Numbers 10 tells us. God also told them they need to listen to the trumpet. He instructed Moses in the use of various trumpet blasts. Wouldn't that be a good thing, huh? We blow the trumpet, the people gather. You blow the trumpet, the people go to war or whatever. And they were also used in, uh, in worship, Numbers 10. Then in uh, Numbers chapter 13, the Lord directed them, guided them to go and spy out the land. And so 12 Leaders, one from each tribe, was chosen and sent to spy out the land that God had promised them. And they returned after a while with a very favorable report about the abundance of the land. But they brought a very unfavorable report about the formidable inhabitants in the land. And so the people were discouraged because of this negative report. Don't give a negative, faithless report. Okay? And they became too scared. And a crisis of faith ensued. And they just began to grumble. Numbers 14 verses 1 to 20 tells us they began to say, The Lord has brought us here to kill us in the wilderness and not lead us into the land of promise. And the people were so discouraged that they decided that they would rather return to slavery in Egypt. After all the Lord had done. Only, jo- uh, jo- only Joshua and Caleb pleaded with the people to trust God, go in and take the land promised by God. But the congregation were just so dis- discouraged and defeated that they wanted to stone them. And the Lord just becomes kind of irritated and he said, How long will they not believe in me? And but for the intercession, of Moses and Aaron, the people would have been in, disinherited and destroyed by God. And as a result, their disobedience basically led them to a 38-year wandering in the wilderness. Numbers 14, 21 to 38. And of course, there's a sad little incident in Numbers 14 where the people suddenly realize that the opportunity has been missed and so they say, okay, 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 we've changed our minds. We will go. We will take the land. And Moses says, no, it's too late now. The Lord's presence is he's not in this now. So they say, it doesn't matter. We'll go anyway. And they get defeated. And so we need to learn this warning, the disaster of doing things at the wrong time. There is an opportune moment. If you miss it, you've missed it. Don't always think you've got forever to do everything. Sometimes we miss the moment. And even Moses himself is disobedient, doesn't follow the guidance of the Lord. And as a result, he is told that he will not lead the people into the promised land. And it's a very interesting, rather strange little incident in Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 to 12, where God, the people are once again grumbling about the lack of water And so God says to Moses, and he says to him very specifically in verse 8 of Numbers 20, tell the rock to yield its water. So what was he supposed to do? Speak to the rock. What did Moses do? He just did the traditional thing that he'd done before. He struck the rock with his staff. Why? Because previously in Exodus 17, 6, we're told that God had said to him, to get water from the rock, you strike it. And possibly he just did the same thing again. How like the church. 
You know, I had a friend, I, had once, I once had a friend, how's that? Eh? And he was a pastor of a great church in Durban, and he's now passed on to glory. Uh, and he was speaking to me one day, and he said, Oh, Mike, we, used to, we had this amazing service. All, you know, the theme was spiritual warfare. And it was unbelievable. We had all kinds of uh, visual aids. We did all these things. And at the end of the service, the people said, Charles, we must do this again. This must become an annual thing. And he said, we will never, ever do this again. And that was Charles's way. He said, we just don't do things and, be, and develop traditions. It's so easy in the church. You do it once. And then it becomes a tradition. We, we've got to do it every single Sunday like that or every year like that. And, and there's a lesson here that we've got to do things because God tells us to do them, not because we've always done them that way. Anyway, God is very severe uh, with Moses. And because he didn't speak to the rock and chose to just strike the rock, God says, that's it, Moses. You didn't uh, uh, treat me as holy. And so Joshua will lead the people into the promised land and not you. And then the final lesson from the book of Numbers relates to mercy and victory. In all of this disobedience and in all of this uh, chaos, God's mercy is still seen and his victories are still given in a number of ways. There's the mercy that is revealed in the provision of the manna, of the meat, and of the water. Numbers 11 and Numbers 20, God provides mercifully for his people. God mercifully gives them healing. When, when, when the snakes begin to bite the people in their disobedience, God says, take this bronze servant, make it, lift it up on a pole, and whoever looks to the servant will live. And it becomes a type of Jesus. John 3, 16 refers to John 3, 14 and 15 rather, that when Jesus is lifted up, we look to him and we are healed of the sickness of sin. God's mercies are also seen in the victories that they win in various battles that they uh, enter into east of the Jordan. They defeat um, a couple of kings there and they take their lands and eventually the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh will settle in those lands east of the Jordan. That's Numbers 32. We also see very interestingly God's mercy in the protection of his people from an attempt to curse them through Balaam. Balaam is a strange, false prophet who sort of sometimes seems to hear God, but he has a, a disobedient side to him. He's a false prophet. And there's a very interesting incident in Numbers 23 where the king... I think it's of the Amorites wants to get Balaam to curse God's people, to put a demonic curse on them. And so I'll just read you. That's an amazing God so overrules this false prophet that he says this. Numbers 23 verse 19. He says, God is not a man that he should lie because repeatedly this uh, king is saying curse them and, and Balaam just finds that he can only bless them. And uh, every time he does the same thing, he blesses them. And Balaam says, why haven't you cursed them this time? And he says, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless. He is blessed and I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. Isn't that a wonderful picture of the way God's people are blessed, and that is it, and it cannot be reversed. He says, I have not, or he, God, has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Isn't that beautiful? God's people are blessed. That is it. Settled. And then, uh, in verse 23, sometimes we think, oh my goodness me, the, the, the Satanists and the occultists are trying to put curses on us. And I want to tell you, if you're close to God and you're walking in His ways, they'll just bounce off. And that's what we see, verse 23. He says, for there is no enchantment against Jacob and no divination against Israel. What a wonderful mercy. We're you don't have to fear the enemy because greater is he that is in you than he 
that is in the world. There is no enchantment against Jacob and no divination against Israel. And then finally, we see God's mercy in the second opportunity to enter the land. Numbers 33 to 35. So that's just a little summary of numbers. Okay, I hope you got something out of it. Now we very, very quickly going to look at the book of Deuteronomy, which is really the swan song, the three final sermons of Moses before he dies. And they are standing on the boundary of the promised land. They've already arrived there after 38 years of wandering. And Moses is told, because of your disobedience, because you did not treat me as holy, because you struck the rock and didn't speak to it, and you didn't do exactly what I told you, you are not the one who will lead them in. You will die. And then he gives these final words in the book of Deuteronomy. And it can be summed up under three headings, history, law, and farewell. So we've got numbers 1, uh, 1 to 443. He reviews Israel's history, kind of repeats the history of their disobedient wanderings in the wilderness, and he reminds them of the need to obey God's law. And so he gets into the law in, in chapter 444 right through to chapter 28 and verse 68. He speaks of God's covenant people, Israel, who must obey the Ten Commandments, which are republished in Deuteronomy and various other civil and ceremonial laws. And this is so that the people of Israel will remain distinct from the surrounding pagan nations and have a distinct holy way of life so that they may enjoy the blessings of God. That's the, the, the summary of the law. And then in chapter 29, 1 to 34, 12, Moses says goodbye. That's his farewell. To prepare Israel for life in the promised land, he calls for a renewed commitment to obey God's covenant as a way of choosing life. Look at verse 19. Why don't we just read it? Let me just read it to you. It's a lovely challenge. Numbers 30 and verse 19, where Moses challenges the people. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, Choose life that you and your offspring may live. So what are we choosing? Life through obedience. Choose life. He gives the priests a copy of God's law and he prepares to hand over the leadership to Joshua. They sing a great song of faith. He blesses the people of Israel and then he goes up Mount Nebo to view the promised land, and Moses dies. And that's the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Next week, we're going to start with Joshua and preparations to enter the promised land. Let's just pray. Thank you, Lord, for the great lessons of your people in the wilderness and the swan song message of Moses in Deuteronomy. And we today want to choose life, the way of blessing that comes through following your word. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.